Well, first of all, hi everyone. Thank you very much for watching or listening. Uh, Liam Hartree here today with another episode of Presenting Champions. And today I'm joined by a very special fighter, Dino Hunt. Um, today he's going to be joining us, sharing his journey through uh, quite a lot of stuff. First of all, through the world of uh, football hooliganism, football violence, uh, being involved in that, the unlicensed white collar scene, where he's competed extensively um, in unlicensed boxing, or white collar boxing, whatever you call it, won two titles in that as well, two-time champion. He's also competed for Spartan, uh, bare knuckle pit fighting as well, which I gotta say is one of the most brutal forms of combat that you'll see anywhere. Um, in, a, in a tiny eight foot by eight foot pit, nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. So as always with my stories, this is a little bit deeper than just a sports story. It also carries an important social message uh, about how Dino turned his life around for various things he's been through in, in his past as well. So we're going to have a good talk today. Stay tuned. Champ, thank you for coming on the show and thank you for making time for this, mate. It's, it's awesome to have you on. Yeah, you're welcome. It's good to be on, Liam. Yeah, uh, well, it's a pleasure. And I know you've got a great story to tell. So um let's go back to the beginning i mean i think that's the place to start i don't always start at the beginning but i will uh today so you started boxing as i understand it at quite a young age you know i mean i think when we were talking before this you said around the age of nine you started boxing so take us back to um where you grew up and where you first got interested in boxing and, and training and everything yeah um it was about nine the first boxing gym um i ever walked in in bradford and my, my cousin Dave, Dave Ramsden, he was a pro boxer at the time. <clears throat> he used to bring pads up to my mum's and, you know, do a bit of training there. And then he started taking me down to his gym and I just picked it up pretty quickly, really. Um, but I was always, I was always, always with Dave and I'm still pretty close with Dave now. Um, but yeah, he taught me, taught me how to throw my first punch, really, did Dave. Yeah, that's where it started. And then, was it like you know when you first started with this was it like um you took to it easily like a duck to water or type of thing and you were just into it straight away or was there more of a transition into like finding your feet type of thing and, and and getting into it like that you know i did yeah i did take to it i took to it straight away i picked it up pretty quick i don't know if it would cost dave for a good teacher or it would just some natural that come to me but yeah i seemed to pick it up pretty quick but the only thing was it were when I was a kid, I was a pretty, uh, pretty plump kid, pretty overweight, which is the reason I think, she's never said it, but I think it's the reason my mum got me into boxing with Dave, inviting him up to our house, and, and it progressed from there, really. Yeah, okay. So you progressed from there, but also um, you mentioned to me when we were setting this up that there was an interest in football as well at a young age, and obviously that... Um, That'll come back into this story later on, won't it? But starting at the, with those early years in uh, in football and everything like that, um, was that kind of like a dual thing? And what I mean by that is, was it like boxing and football side by side? Or did you sort of move out of boxing and go into football? What was the, the timeline on that, if you get what I mean? It was sort of, it, um, it was sort of, I gave boxing up. I never really took boxing serious. Um, and then I was playing football at school with my mates and, and I got asked to join a team and then that went end of boxing really and it's it's a big regret of mine to, that I stopped when I did because I'm always thinking now if I'd have carried on where could I have been what if I'm not saying I would have made anything of myself but I enjoyed it and I enjoy it now so there's always that big what if yeah yeah that's a big one and what age were you by this time? Like we're talking about now, like by the time you were sort of coming out of boxing, you were getting into football and stuff. Was it like your teenage years type of thing or? No, no. I, um, I come out of boxing after probably about a year, two years. So like ages of 10 and 11, started playing for my local football team um, with all my mates that were from school, mates from different schools. And it progressed then slowly. <clears throat> I forgot about boxing. Um, I used to watch boxing still when there were fights on telly, but that was about as far as it went. I never walked in a boxing gym for years. Yeah, yeah. So the football took over and everything, uh, which is which is cool. 
And uh, at this time of, of your life, what sort of kid were you? I mean, because you said about being a bit overweight. Were you quite confident or were you quite sort of shy and like the other way? What what were you like at that time in your life? No, I, um, I was pretty shy, really. Were, I had a good group of friends around me, um, but I used to get picked on now and then. And there were middle schools and I know they've got rid of middle schools now. But it went from um, first school, middle school, upper school. And I would plump all the way through school, really. Mm -hmm. And I used to get the odd remark and what have you. But I would always look after in that um, circle of friends that I had. You know, they, they, it, well, it were just like a, a pack if somebody picked on me or tried to bully me. My mates would step in. And then it, I sort of got that mindset then. Well, if, if they're going to help me, I'm going to have to learn to help them. And it, it just went from there. Yeah, absolutely. Now, this is um, something that comes to an interesting part of the story for fight fans and for people interested in this type of thing, because um, at a certain point in time, you know, you were quite the street fighter and everything from, from what we were talking about setting this up. And you were, you know, you were into sort of uh, with your group of friends, you know, testing yourself against like the tough people in your local area and whatnot. So um, just talk us through that process, really. I mean, I don't have one specific question about it, but just how that mindset developed and, you know, what you were doing when you were fighting with people like around pubs and, and all that type of thing, basically. Well, it, because I already knew from, um, from putting boxing gloves on that I enjoyed fighting and the, there were nothing to be scared of getting it. So then it sort of progressed from there. And because of the pack mentality, what you had with your friends, and you didn't want to let them down, so you wouldn't run off if there were any trouble. And then by, by um, 16, 17, obviously we'd all started going out, trying as looking pubs, even though we were underage. And we were getting in there, and we were getting to know people. And obviously there's fully grown men in there then. So one thing leads to another and we fancied our chances against them if, if anything ever kicked off and we all we all stuck together and it went from there and we did we did our height to be honest. Yeah, you I mean it might be it might not be something you can sort of remember now and things like this, but um you were obviously going around sort of trying your luck with the, with these different fellas and everything, and you were still a young and yourself by the sound of it at this point in time. But how many of these types of, of instances were there, you know, where you were like fighting outside pubs and things like that? Is it something you've lost count of these days? No, there, there, were, um, there were a lot, Liam, there was an awful lot. Um, and it was fun while it was lasting until you start getting caught by police and you're in front of courts and you've got, you end up with a big criminal record and they're threatening you with jail. And, you know, it's, and it's hard to get out of then because you're in that circle and that's all you know because all your mates are still going out and they're saying, they know why aren't you coming out? Come on. And then you go and then it, it happens again. And it, it just, it's just an hard um, thing to break away from. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's hard to get out of uh, that type of circle and, and the mindset as well, you know, of that. And because um, you mentioned, obviously, when we were setting this up, it was a bit of a buzz as well, you know, at that time. Talking about that, though, like the football, more specifically, because we touched on like the, the, you know, some of the pub stuff and like the bar fights and all that type of thing or street fights, whatever you want to call it. But in terms of like football hooliganism or whatever you want to call it, football violence, you know, being in with that crowd, um, was that happening at the same time or was that something you sort of grew into type of thing a little bit later on? Well, um, no, it wasn't happening at the same time. It was. I'm a bit of a buzz chaser, mainly, and I, I like to get my buzz from doing summer, which were going out and having a fight with men and not leaving my mates. That was my buzz at that time. And then it became the norm. So on to the next buzz, which were going to, I used to go to watch Leeds United, but from a young age, I was watching Leeds. I had a season ticket. And then as I got older, I started taking more interest because it, it used to get a, a daily paper every day. There were always England fans fighting. There were, but I used to like it. I used to read it for hours. And then I started getting in with like um, some of the service crew lads at Leeds. And 
they were doing just what I were already doing, drinking, having fun. But that pack mentality were a lot bigger than what I were used, what I were used to at home. But I enjoyed it. And I've still got good friends um, that still go to Leeds. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you something just as a bit of uh, a bit of trivia. I mean, I'm obviously I'm in Wales and everything. If you I don't know if you if you know that, but that's where I am. But I've been up to uh around some of this stuff for Leeds United, like Ellen Road and some of the places I've been up around there. And um man, you know, I tell you what, the Leeds fans, a different breed, man. You know, I mean like, like the fire that you guys have in your belly for your team is uh is next level, you know. And I've um that's a that's a story for another time, but you know. So with this, were you like um how long were you involved in like the football sort of scene type of thing? <clears throat> um I used to go home and away every single week. Me and a couple of lads from Bradford would go over to Leeds. We'd either get trained. Very rare we went on coaches. We did, we did now and then, but we used to like to go on train, do his own thing. Um, you know, basically just dodging. Went to Exeter by plane, just so we could get there in 40 minutes, 45 minutes, rather than run, drive and get on beer and have a, have a look round and what have you. But, um, yeah, I... I enjoyed I enjoyed every part of the day and we went home and away and we were up and down country every week. And the, to be honest, the worst part of the day were the 90 minutes of football back then because we were terrible and it spoiled there most, most of the time. Yeah, absolutely. And another thing I think people will be interested to know about with this, you know, is like your mentality to it because you said about the pack mentality and whatnot but what i mean by this question is like you know you mentioned the buzz and everything so you know like on the build up to one of these things when you're on the train when you're on the you know you're on the plane to exit or on the build up it is what, what i'm getting at with like one of these scraps and stuff what were you feeling i mean were you feeling like the adrenaline and like the buzz from it like all day long until you got there type of thing or I was just curious what was going through your mind. I, I, I used to feel the adrenaline and the buzz. If if we say, for instance, we drew Man United in Cup, I'd be I'd be buzzing two, three weeks before the game, getting ourselves ready, and it would just, it, yeah, it would just um, it give you me butterflies, you know, thinking about it and thinking what was going to happen. I'm planning where we were going. I'm planning how we were gonna dodge police and, and do what we wanted to do. I mean, uh, there's a friend of mine, um, Gary Exley, um, that lives in Bradford, and to this day he still says to me, have you still got your invisible coat? Because I wasn't just a mindless thug. I, I could actually think things through and I was able to dodge, somehow dodge the police. I don't know whether it would just look or, or it would because I was good at thinking it through, but... I, I didn't get caught half as many times as I should have. Yeah, that's amazing in itself, mind. You know, I mean, the whole invisible coat thing. I mean, fair play. Um, yeah, dodging the law. I mean, it's not easy. Talk to us. Talk us through um, what a football type scrap would be like you know now but just to precursor this a little bit, I don't want you to say anything that gives anything away that could be a nuisance for you in any way of like you know people catching up with you or whatever. So maybe don't mention specific locations. It's up to you how much you want to say or not. So I'm just putting that in there. But yeah, it, you're saying you arranged these fights. Like, how much can you say about where they would take place, what they'd be like, how many people were involved? Just for somebody who's never been there, if you had to describe it, that's that's the type of thing for like for our audience, you know? Yeah, yeah. You would um, sometimes you could you you didn't plan it and you'd be just in a pub and somebody had uh, uh, spotted a team of lads, you know. It would have lads with shirts and scarves on. It were lads that were dressed like us with, uh, you know, jeans, smart, smart casual wear. Um, and then that bit would all get together and it, it, it would be, and that would that was the start of the buzz, knowing that you were going to get there, you, you were you'd look behind you, there were all your lads, you we'd all stood side by side and no nobody run. Yeah, amazing. That is uh it's quite something because I know obviously some people watching this, listening to this, you know, they'll know what it was like because they will have been involved too. And a lot of fighters, even in other types of things, will know what it was like. But just for somebody listening to this who's never been there, it's it's a good insight into what it is uh what it is like. 
Um, let's see. Who was that? Okay, with this again, I don't know how much you can say about it. So you know, we'll we'll play it by ear. But who were some of the toughest groups, or you know, other firms, or whatever it whatever it was, you know, that you ke- like came up against, or some of the key incidents that stick in your mind? Again, I don't know if you can give much away about this because I don't I don't want to get anyone nicked with any of this stuff. But um, are there maybe one or two more than any others that stick in your mind now? That one, on? the, one, the, the worst place I've been, uh, probably the roughest place I've been, was it, it, were actually, it was actually Exeter. Um, their crew were called the Sly Crew. And yeah, all day long we were at it there, all day. Um, it was a bit tough for me, Liam, because I've been brought up in Bradford. I live in Bradford. I know a lot of Bradford City fans and they absolutely despise Leeds. And it got to the stage that when I met my wife, I couldn't take her out in Bradford because everybody knew I was and they'd want to have a pop at me. And it's only been the last few years I can go out drinking in Bradford if I wanted to. I couldn't take her for a meal in Bradford Town Centre. It, it you were just watching over your shoulder all the time. Yeah, yeah. So you made obviously quite a name for yourself on the scene, and like everybody knew. Yeah, I get, I get where you're coming from. So considering the fact that you loved it and everything, though, and you got the buzz out of it and and all that, I mean, all the way through, I'm getting the vibe of like the buzz, the adrenaline, you know, from the pub fighting, from the football fighting, and whatnot. Um, what just made you make the decision to sort of come out of that scene and everything? Was it like the law and being threatened and that type of thing again, or was it? You know what? What made you say I need to take a step back from this type of thing? Yeah, I would. My life was spiraling. Really, I, I'd blown up to seventeen and a half stone. I was going out. I was drinking all the time. There were drugs involved, and the way I was carrying on, I, I was gonna. I was gonna, definitely would have ended up dead or seriously ill, if not behind bars. Yeah. And so you just made the decision, like, you know, was it was it like an overnight thing or was it like a gradual, like, realising? Well, no. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking, how, how can I break away from, from this? It's all I know. How. So what I did was I, I just, I didn't tell my mum or anything. I just one day, I was walking through um, town and... I walked into army careers. I thought, I'm going to join army. That's the only way I can get away. And even they won't have me because they said I had to wait six months um, because I'd just been convicted for a criminal offence. So I'd, I'd, had to wait, I'd have to wait six months and behave myself for six months. So that never materialised because then I met my now wife, Gemma, and... She more or less got pregnant straight away. Yeah, absolutely. So then, you know, family took over and, and it, uh, you know, I get I get how it goes. So before we move on into like boxing and, and everything like that, you know, because I'm sort of breaking this down into like phases of your life type of thing. Um, before we move into that, were, so you were convicted of something, you know, and, and that's cool. But it sounds like considering the amount of fights that you had and the amount of stuff that was going on, most of the time you you were like in the clear, like we said about the invisible coat and everything. Um, when you did get done for it, if you don't mind me asking, was it like a suspended type of thing or did you actually see the inside of uh, of jail and all that, you know? No, no, I didn't go to jail, no. Um, I had to pay compensation, got fined um, and basically told her I needed a smart and my act up. That that were on the the, the last time I were ever in court. Um, they basically said if you carry on the way you are, you, you go you're gonna go down them steps, which that opened my eyes more or less straight away. I thought, I ain't going, I ain't going to prison for nobody. Yeah, that's fair enough. I mean you know the the thing is about going to jail and that i mean i know so many people who've, who've been in there and everything and a lot of people think oh you know it's it's it's, a, it's like a cool thing or it's a mark of respect that you've been in there and you've got through it and stuff but it's, it's not because you know i mean you look at people's lives after they come out of there and the limits and you can't get jobs and you can't go to other countries and you can't do this and you can't do that obviously depending on what it is that you go down for but you know it, it's a really limiting thing so yeah the fact you dodged that i mean it's a, it's a lucky um uh, lucky break what would you say to somebody who was in your position 
like say if you know there's young lads and you probably know young lads now like through the boxing gym and through things like that who are into that type of scene um I'm not looking down on the scene now, but if there's anyone who wants to get out of it, though, and they think that they're going to get in serious trouble and whatnot, what would you say to those people? Like, what advice would you give to, like, your, almost like your younger self, basically, in, in that sense, yeah. if you get what I mean? If I were giving advice to my younger self, I would have, I'd definitely say, stay in that boxing gym, because, you know, that that's, that's the buzz that... It's it's never fading. You're always in there. You're always meeting new people. You're always testing yourself. You're always pushing yourself constantly. There's always something new, and you never know anything. You're always learning. If somebody else walks into the gym new, you learn off them. It's it's just ongoing. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, I mean, important lesson there as well. Um, you know, success breeds success at the end of the day and what I mean is like you know this from the gym you're around other people with a dream with a goal with you know something that they're aiming for whatever and the positivity of that like the banter and, the, and just the vibe in it just rubs off on you you know I mean it's just it's hard to explain but you know you know what I mean and it's it's a good lesson uh it's a very very good lesson so okay so then moving on a little bit like into how you got back into boxing and everything like this Obviously, you mentioned uh, you started a family, uh, four kids now, and you've been together 19 years with with your um, your wife. So congratulations, by the way, you don't see a lot of long uh, marriages these days or, you know, like that. So that's cool. What made, what made the decision to get back into boxing? Was it like I need extra money for the family type of thing? Or was it, you know, what, what was going through your mind at that time where you thought, OK, I want to give boxing a try again, if that makes sense? Yeah, no, but boxing's never been about money. Never, ever been about money for me. It's been about <clears throat> the buzz, the buzz, really, walking through them ropes. It's, um, but I was starting um, back into boxing again. It were accidental, really. It, my, son, my son were playing football, my eldest son, Caden. Um, he was playing for a football team, and they were wanting to raise money for a trip to Holland, to, to take our kids to Holland. So, because I were, obviously I were overweight because I'd been drinking all the time, me and a friend of mine, Blessy, I, he was, I think he was my son's manager at the time, were Blessy. He said, right, why don't we do a sponsored weight loss, me and you, lose three stone in three months. So I, I said, yeah, let, let's go for it then. So like a race between me and him who could lose three stone fastest. So joint gym, went to pure gym, stopped drinking, started seeing weight fall off me. For how can I lose weight faster? Um, so I went to Oogie's boxing gym. Um, Oogie welcomed me with open arms. Um, an old Great Britain coach, Alwyn Belcher, he were there. And um, a family friend, Los Roach, he used to be a pro boxer. And he were my cousin's best mate. He took me under his wing and started training me with Loz. <clears throat> and he'd been in army with Loz and he, he, he knew how to get me fit. <laughs> he, he got me the fittest I've, I've ever been with Loz. And we used to have a laugh as well. It, it was good. It was good. We had a good little team. Um, and so when he started training me, it his, the weight dropped off and then I was getting the love for boxing back. And then Liam Duffy, who's a referee at Spartan now, he said, what about having a crack at a fight? You know, and, do you fancy it? I said, yeah, yeah, go on then. So uh, me and a pal of mine, my old brain, he, he started training with us and um, we got a fight set up. I think his first one were, it were actually in Bradford at Flair Nightclub and the atmosphere, it just... It blew the roof off. Everybody were there. All our pals were there. It would be crazy. Yeah, and that gave you the uh, like the fire in your belly to get going again. So then, obviously, from there, you you launched into um, well, competing more often. And and I know when we were speaking, setting this up, you said that you've pretty much lost count of uh, how many fights you've actually had. So. With with what I always do with this, when, when it's somebody who's had a lot of fights, is break it down into some highlights and everything. So, um, first of all, do you, I mean, I know you said you've lost count, but do you know roughly 
how many fights you've had like is it more than less than or you just totally uh had so many that it's it's lost count of it i will um i would have said i've had i had um we had a lockdown now as well i would have said 15 20 fights that yeah okay so keep him busy yeah, um, so yeah. I've, no, I'll carry on, yeah. yeah we because i met a guy called sam um sam godfrey and <clears throat> we still fight on his shows now i said he'd be and i've sort of stuck with him all the way i fought at barnsley metrodome on neil kirkwood's show and what have you but <clears throat> I tend to like to suss promoters out if they're going to use you or if they, if they are. And Sam's always been fair, he's always been all right, mate. So I've just stuck with him and fought on his shows. Um, he's helped me, he's helped me out. He's become a family friend, actually. Yeah, oh, that's good. I mean, that's the beautiful thing about, about boxing, really, is uh, some of the respect and some of the loyalty that you, you know you can have. And uh, obviously, how it turns lives around as well. You know, I mean, I say this in so many interviews, but I've seen boxing save people from everything you can think of mental health physical health addiction drinking low self-esteem whatever it is it's, it's a beautiful sport in that way it just saves people's bacon from you know so much so many types of problems so okay 15 20 fights you won two titles as well and you've uh, you've been a busy boy on the uh, the white collar scene what are some of your proudest moments and with this obviously i know you said earlier that you sort of wished you'd given boxing a go when you when you was a bit younger obviously you got back into it now and you have achieved some good things so um what are some of your favorite fights and your like your proudest moments from your boxing career basically um question i know but yeah i enjoyed fighting at bands and metro with a great venue <laughs> It was just um, one of them where if you want from Barnsley, you were never going to win unless you knocked your opponent out. So, um, but I had uh, the, probably I fought a big arena in Derby. I beat a kid there to retain my belt. But probably when I won my belt down in Derby at Roller World, that was, that was my favourite moment. Yeah. And how did it feel with regards what what I mean with this now is like I was just saying just now, obviously, when you were younger, you know, you wanted to give it a go and you, you had that what if and everything. But when you won these titles now, was it like a sort of like a redemption type of thing of like you proved like I can do it, if you if you get what I mean? Did it answer any of those questions that like that you had from before? Not really. It probably um it probably gave me more questions in my head. Um, with it just being a semi-pro circuit, um, should it mean should it mean more than it does, or should I be you know should I be as happy because I've won a semi-pro? Sh should I have stuck at boxing and gone pro? Could I have? Um, so <clears throat> I say that winning that belt was my proudest moment in boxing. Personally, for me, it was, but um, the proudest, really, the proudest moment was when uh, me and my wife when we took over Rock Solid Boxing Gym in Bradford, and I'd stumbled up across that just total, by total chance. I didn't even know it was there, the place, the gym, um, and it would be because Huggies shut at six o'clock and I was working, and I needed to train for fights, <coughs> so. Uh, pal of mine, he, he said, here, I found another gym that stays up until 10 o'clock and it's got a boxing ring and everything. In. So I started going up and training there because I could obviously go straight from work. And then the guy that owns it said, because uh, it's like a weightlifting gym upstairs, you go downstairs in the boxing room. And he said, well, why don't you take over and get some kids in here off at the streets? So then it, it was just like a light bulb moment. Hey, why don't I try? And give these kids what I missed out on, you know, and, and keep, keep them off at streets and out of trouble. Yeah, that's a beautiful thing. I mean, honestly, I mean, you know, there, there's so many people like when we're coming up and that, you know, we don't have those role models. We don't have those people to, to look up to in, in a positive sense. So um, I got just I mean, it's not even a question. I'm just saying I personally got all the respect in the world for people who give back, you know, to, to people in need and kids and all that type of thing. Um, 
tell us a little bit more about running the gym then, because this is the, I mean, I was going to come to this soon anyway, but we've got there. So, um, you know, what you enjoy about it, what the process has been like, you know, building it up and getting the kids in there. Um, anything you'd like to say, really? I mean, I don't, I don't mind with this one. Yeah, we've gone from um, when we first started, we've gone from just doing one mixed class and it's just got busier. And it's a bit of a family thing, really, because my wife, she does all admin. Um, my daughter, Isla, she's seven. She's now fighting on ICB shows. Um, I think last time out, she had three fights in one day, stopped a girl in the second round. Um, my eldest son, he boxes. Um, he's just about to be carded up to go into amateurs. Um, he's going to a, an amateur gym at the minute. And my middle son, Lucas, he's, he's going to be one to watch. He's Lucas. He's, um, he's got a special talent. He's never been interested in football. He's just he's basically lived in a gym from being three years old and he doesn't know any different. He's been hoogies. He's been over a golden team with uh, a pal of mine, um, P. McDonough. Uh, Kobe McNamara has been training. Kobe's up only 21. He's just turned pro unbeaten. He's been training Lucas. I've been training him, but he likes to tell me that he knows more than me now, so he's got, I've got to take him to these other places. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's a proper uh, family affair type of thing then. I mean, that's, that's nice, that is, you know, I mean, uh, passing on your knowledge to your kids and, and everything is, uh, yeah, one wants to watch fair play. Fair play. I was going to ask you about that, funnily enough, like if they're going to follow in your footsteps, but, you know, we've uh, we've answered that. Amazing. Um, let's talk a little bit more about, about the gym as well in terms of, like, your kids are doing really well, which is awesome, uh, and you're bringing them on bringing kids off the street and things like that is it sort of is the gym sort of open to anyone like people to box for fitness and people to box who, who want to compete type of thing or how, how does it work you know from that side of things yeah it's it's open to anybody that wants to train and get fit and yeah if you if if you come and you get the buzz for boxing like i did and you do want to test yourself in a fight then uh there's two coaches there, me, uh, Robbie Adamson. Robbie's um, ex-Spartan world champion, bare knuckle pit fighter is Robbie. But he's got a very, very good boxing background as well, Robbie. And it is basically just like a, a scientific encyclopedia for, for the fight world. He knows what to eat, when to eat it, how to train, which part of body. And it, uh, we have some laughs. It works. We bounce off each other. It's good. It's, he, he takes a class and pushes everyone to limits. Um, yeah, we make a pretty good team, all of us down there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's like we get, we start from, um, we've got, I think it starts from ages of five as youngest ones. Um, and it goes right up. I think we've got a guy called Marco. Connor Loser, who's a very good friend of mine. I think he fought on a last show for us in Bradford. I think Mark's 55 and he's got a fight coming up in February. So, yeah, it, anybody can go on. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, that's, that's the other great thing about boxing as well is obviously in a gym, you know, people from all backgrounds, whatever background you're from, training side by side. That's another thing is it's a very sort of inclusive sport i would say as well it's another cool thing so um things are going well with the gym then i love that love the you know bringing kids off the street and things as well and, and giving them guidance so it's, it's good on all counts now you mentioned robbie big shout out to him as well uh he's been on on his show uh oh i don't know probably about a year ago now or whatever but amazing talented fighter he is so obviously with yourself and spartan and um bernacle pit fighting and all that side of things what gave you the idea to switch over to that from boxing, you know, from the white collar scene and sort of give it a go? Obviously, you've had a lot of practice with uh, close quarters, bare knuckle fights from like the street and from the football days, probably. But um, what initially gave you the idea to do that? Well, to be honest, I never, ever really fancied it. I never used to watch bare knuckling or, or they were only a matter of time before uh, 
Robbie got me into it, wasn't it? And um, originally, um, I think he wanted to test something out. Uh, I think there were, good, there were talk of being a, a gloved pit fight because obviously with bare knuckle, it's normally over pretty quick, isn't it? So I think they wanted to have a bash at testing gloves. Um, but <clears throat> most of Spartan lads were against it, said, you know, in air bales, it's bare knuckle, which I understand because I see Spartan as a bare knuckle fight club. Um, but Robbie just like, it, it, Robbie wants, wanted to try it out and nine times out of ten when when Robbie gets an idea, it normally works. So I, I just agreed. I said, yeah, it's, uh, basically I will run a bit guinea pig and uh, see, see what happened. And then when the... Um, they were saying, no, it's a, it's a bare knuckle. I thought, well, I've already agreed to it now. So I said, well, I'll do it with gloves off. <clears throat> but before that even come about, I was thinking, if I'm going to get in there with gloves, why don't I get in with gloves off? So it would have come about anyway. Even if I'd have had my first one with gloves, I'd have been in there without them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it makes sense. It makes total sense. And... um. I did an interview with Christian only probably like a week ago or something like that. And he mentioned your fight as being one of the top fights of uh, of last year. He had some very, very kind words to say about it. By the way, I don't know if you've seen that, but that, that's what he was saying. Um, so walk us through in your own words what the fight was like. Again, I don't really have a narrow question about it. Just the venue, the fighting in close quarters like that, um, the buzz, just anything that sticks in your mind about it, really, you know. Well, to be honest, I didn't know what to expect because I've been and I've seen air bears and I've, I've tried to suss it out thinking there's not much space there and, you know, if you, if you swing mad at you, you're going to gas yourself out. So all that went through my mind. And then um, Robbie, Robbie Adamson, he, he'd uh, asked me to corner him down, I can't remember where it was, where it went out, but we're on back to the bone. And I think he was fighting a guy from Sweden. And at ringside, I could hear bones crunching. And, and to be honest, I think Robbie were taking a few just to get him into it. And because that's what he likes, he likes getting it. Robbie is he's, he's just mad. But, um, and then when I see how much, because I've known Robbie a few years before, before I've cornered him for this fight. And then when I see how much art he'd got and how much he had to dig and, how bad his face was, and then the one thing, it didn't matter who I fought in that pit, there were no way I were um, going to get beat by getting, by quitting, or it would have had to be a knockout or a stoppage. So I, 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 I wasn't going to stop because after seeing how deep he dug, I thought, I can't let him down. I can't let it because Robbie cornered me in my first um, Ben pit fight, and I thought I'm, I'm not letting him down. Mm. So off we off we went. Yeah, and what's it like being in in the pit? Because obviously, with all your experience in in the ring as well, what I mean by this now is obviously for one thing, I've heard that it's a lot faster. Obviously, without you know, with people not having gloves on, it being in a smaller space and everything. It seems like like obviously very, very fast paced. Um, I've had loads of guys from Spartan on this show and they all say the same thing. But also like in terms of, um, well, yeah, just your memories from in the fight, obviously from being in a small space like that as well. Um, what's it like in, in the pit? I mean, I know that's, that's a pretty big question, but just in your own words, really. To be honest, it's um, from the outside looking in, it's you think, you know, it's small, you've nowhere to move. But you've already registered that in your brain. So when you're in there, you know it's small. You, you don't you don't try to move. You're just trying to dig deep and what have you. But um, to be fair, the, the kid that fought Shaq Jones, he, the guy could hit. He, he probably hit me the hardest I've ever been hit. And um, you're trying to suss each other out in there to find them openings. And I, I knew it was from the fighting background because somebody had told me he did a bit of MMA. <clears throat> and I thought he, he, he's got to have done some boxing the way he were. 
he were dodging my shots and countering with not just a single shot, there were threes and fours he was countering with and he was parrying and, and as it happened, he, he, he's now become friends with me on Facebook as Shaq and, he, and he is from a boxing back, I think he's just a born fighter to be honest, he's done MMA, boxing, everything. But I've watched the fight back and the video doesn't do him justice, just how hard he every single shot. I mean, um, on the Monday after, I'd, I had two black eyes, my head were out there, my ribs were black. But uh, until you do it, you can't describe what it feels like in that pit. It's just the, the buzzies are up there. It's massive. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine that, and that is what all the people say. Um, obviously, what's something people will be curious about, I think, and this is not so much for other fighters now, but this one's more like for fight fans and what have you. Obviously, getting hit with a bare fist versus getting hit with a glove is something that this comes up in a lot of Bernard Clinton interviews I do, including like the ring interviews and whatnot as well, like, you know, bare knuckle in the ring as well as in the pit. People always ask, oh, you know, does it hurt more? Do you feel it more? Blah, blah, blah. So in your own words on, on that one, um, what are your thoughts on like the pain threshold type of concept and, and pushing through that? Well, to be at my fight with Shaq, it, it went the, the full three rounds. It was only fight on the night that went the distance. And to be honest, it yeah, we're getting it. Um, but you don't, it's, it's strange. You don't really feel it. The only thing I felt were my ear, my ear were started hurting in the third round, um, but it took some hammering. When I've watched it back, it took some hammering first from when first bell went. Um, and that was the only thing that were hurting, really, were throbbing. But it's not till like Monday, Tuesday, and you're thinking, oof, you know, it's, it's pain setting in a bit here, there, and everywhere. But yeah, it's, it's not. Pain like, I'm not sure if I want to do this again. It's pain like, get me back in there. I'll, it, what a fight, it was good. Yeah. Well, it was an amazing fight. And as I mentioned, you know, it, it was it was described as being, you know, possible fight of the year. Um, in terms of that, I mean, I know Christian mentioned about you being one of the top people to watch as well for uh for this year, like to keep, you know, one of the people to keep an eye on, I think, and everything like that. So it, you know, you made an impression, basically, is what I'm getting at. So in terms of like your future plans, which is really the last um phase, if you like, of this interview, in terms of where you want to go from here with with everything so obviously you've got your gym um that's going from strength to strength you know your kids are doing doing it and everything in terms of your fighting career like are you going to continue with boxing on the white collar scene as well or are you going to jump full on into like you know pit fighting and all that side of things well um, i've already I'm fighting again on march 18th for christian Chris, christian's a great guy he's been great with me from day one, um, they're, they're an hard working team at, at, at Spartan with uh, Ash and um, Crystal, Crystal Adamson, Robbie's wife, she works hard for them. Uh, Robbie, Robbie works hard. They all seem to pull together as a team. And at first, when I heard of Ben Huckle get fighting and what have you, I'm thinking, I bet it's rough there. And you know what? Everybody just gets on, all fighters have a drink together. It, you know, it's it's strange, really. You know, it's really, really strange. It's not how you'd expect it to be. It's, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's really set up good. So yeah, I'm gonna fight on 18th of March again. Um, Christian's asked me to fight again, so yeah, I'm gonna do Rob. Hopefully, Robbie will be cornering me again, um, and hopefully get first win under my belt. Um, but yeah, the, to be honest, that fight against Shaq. Um, I didn't realise how good it was at the time. I, I, until after when I got out of pit and I didn't really know many people in the crowd and they were all coming up to me, shaking their hands and, you know, what a fight, what a fight. And then it started setting in. We must have put on a bit of a show here. So, yeah, so let's say fair play to Shaq. And he deserved, he deserved the win, did Shaq, um, watching it back. And I, I knew in pit that he'd won as well. But... It's the first time I've ever lost to anything, but felt like I would. 
it, it just had such good feedback and you know I'm, I, I walk in up road with my wife and in Bradford and to, two lads I didn't even know them shouting do you know I seen your fight over there went distance I, I, and my wife said over there I said I don't know you know what I mean so yeah so it's uh it's it's nice that we did put on a good show and it, it's nice that we went distance and it's so much to tell kids and you know it's because it, i think is it 36 seconds the average pit fight lasts yeah yeah, yeah. ours went six minutes <laughs> so. that is wild i mean that, that's the thing you don't see that in the pit much at all um i mean it, I, I can only think of one or two um obviously um Oh, I think it was Dan Al John, wasn't it? And, and Gilberto, the Mexican, I think they went the distance. But like, you you know, you almost never see it. As you say, most of them, it's just like, it's like a minute or something or like 30 seconds. So an amazing achievement and a, a testament to your toughness in there as well, you know, sticking through it with uh, with that amount of thing. And I think that it's, it's an exciting, um, well, you know, it's a sign of what's to come type of thing. You know, the fact you made such an impression, um, I think the best is yet to come, you know, in, in the pit for you type of thing. So... Uh, we're all excited to see you back in there. So we'll be wrapping this up shortly, you know, because for, for people's attention spans and everything, we've talked about a lot. We've talked about some fantastic content. I'm super happy with it. Um, what I usually do to close out with these interviews is ask, is there anyone you'd like to give a shout out to? So what I mean by that is your supporters in any form that they come in. So obviously you mentioned, you know, your wife's very supportive, but this could be anybody um people supporting you on social media people supporting you in person people you train with sponsors i really don't mind like whatever form they come in um just the loyal people who are doing good work behind the scenes is there anything you'd like to say to those people if any of them are uh watching this or listening to this type of thing yeah obviously me my wife Gemma, she she has to put up with my mood swings when i have to cut weight and she, she's got to live with me she's got to, she's got to live without me when i've got to go training um, and I go training at some crazy hours sometimes just because it's quiet, you know, in the morning. But um, yeah, another one that I haven't mentioned, my eldest daughter, Ella, she's the only one that in, in the gym fighting. She's, well, everybody says she's sensible, but, <laughs> you know, yeah, but she's very supportive. She comes to all my fights and, um, you know, I just want my kids to do what makes them happy and it, she does her own thing. Um, I've got my two sponsors, Danny Malarkey at Bright Light, um, and then I've got Naomi uh, off, off streets on sports. She makes all kit like the one that I've got on. Um, and she does really good for uh, for kids as well. You know, money she makes on making these kits, these fight kits, um, she pumps back into getting kids off at street. So that's a good thing. And she lives in Cleckheaton. So she's not too far from me. And she, yeah, she, she does good. She works for ICB as well. That's that's how I originally met her. And me and my wife have become friends with her. But yeah, and just a, a, a massive thank you really to anybody that, you know, that, that spends a lot of money coming to watch us fighting. Everyone at that gym that trains hard and supports us. And, uh, Definitely a massive, massive thank you to Robbie. He does, he does a lot for me and, and his wife, Crystal. But Robbie, yeah, he does, because it's a non-profit gym art and me and Robbie don't get paid. And it's just good to get along with someone like Robbie. It just makes it so much easier, makes it fun for kids. And the gym's growing, everybody's hearing about us. We, we're training kids the right way and... I wouldn't ever do it without Robbie. He, he knows things that I don't know. I learn off Robbie as well. And yeah, it's it's it works. It works well. Yeah. Amazing. Well, it's good to give a shout out to those people because like in your life, obviously, you know who they are. They know who you are and you're helping each other. But when this goes out there to like the wider world type of thing, it's good to go if those people are mentioned because there's a lot of people doing good work like behind the scenes and everything. Do you know what I mean? Like they're not seeing in the public eye. I mean, I, I know Robbie is, but you know what I mean by that. Like there's a lot of people. So it's, it's good to give them a mention. Um, it's been amazing, champ. I mean, what a journey you've been on um, in your life and 
the future is still very bright, obviously, with the gym, with your fighting, with everything you're doing from here. Um, I'm very, very happy with this. I mean, as always with my interviews, we've done some good stuff about like the fights stuff but also we've gone a little bit deeper into like how you've turned your life around or some of the changes that you've you've been through so i'm very very happy um so yeah anything else you'd like to say to your fans your supporters people who buy tickets to watch you fight and other than that we'll we'll wrap it up from there no no just yeah just thank you just keep coming and um yeah don't be put off just because it's bare knuckle it ain't it's in just two brutes getting in and mindless brutes it it is an art form as well maybe not maybe not like boxing is an art it's a different art form but which i'm having to learn and thankfully i've got a good teacher in robbie and um I'd, yeah and the, the referees and medical staff i'll give a shout out to them um dan dan Hunter and dean lister that had their referees spartan all time but they're both very good friends of mine and they do a great job to keep fighters safe. The medics there, they're making sure that you're all right. So you you never you you're never worried about your welfare when when you're there. It's it's really well run. I would impress with it. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I second that massive shout out to the Spartan team as well. Um, as you mentioned, super professional, super respectful. Um, Christian, you know, you've got a heart of gold as well. He's got a time of day for anybody. Um, that's the biggest thing I would say. You know, I got respect obviously for him as a promoter and what he's doing, but like he's got, like, in terms of him as a person, he's got a time of day for everybody. Great team there. Well, the future is very bright for you, my friend. Uh, some good things ahead. Uh, thank you for sharing everything you've shared today. Thank you for being an open book as well, because I mean, that's the other thing is, I mean, you've been speaking from the heart, you've been speaking about some personal stuff in your life. So it's, it's obviously it's um, it's a brave thing to do, you know, to get on, on interviews and, and, and talk about your life. So thank you for everything today. I've enjoyed it. It's been a buzz and uh, I hope it has been for you as well. Uh, in all fairness. Thank you, mate. Yeah, thanks for having me, Liam. Thank you very much for watching. Um, please subscribe to the Simply Inspired YouTube channel and there'll be more videos coming soon.